Well, welcome to the Bill Cartwright Show with Steve Cohen. Our special guest today is three-time NBA champ, Stacey King. Stacey, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I'll, I'll be expecting my check in the mail. Um, you know, I don't do these things free, but for Bill, I gave him a discount. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we we think we know what the uh, what the, what the mail is going to going to send and turn around. As a matter of fact, since I was on your show. <laughs> oh, um, that's right. That's right. We're even then. We're even. We really we were you know we were teammates for a while, but we really don't really know where we came from. And you are from Oklahoma. Uh, I'd be really curious to know um, who really introduced you to basketball uh, when you were in high school. And oh, it, man. It influenced you. Well, I grew up as a football player growing up in the state of Oklahoma, which is uh, football is king there. Basketball is kind of probably the third sport. It's probably the second sport now, but when I was growing up, it was the third sport. It was football, it was baseball, and then basketball was the third sport. Um, so I had two older brothers and I followed them around as a little kid. They played a lot of pickup ball. They were basketball players at the high school level. Uh, they were relatively older than I was. So I was like the little brother that always tagged along that I would be, my, my job would be when the ball went out of bounds on the street ball and then rolled off into the street. My job was to run and go get the ball to bring it back to the playground. That was my job. And, uh, so I always wanted to play though, but I was always too small. So, um, I just kind of followed my brothers into it. And then, you know, everything else was history. You know, I still love football. Football was number one. I played in high school. Uh, and then my, my high school coach basically told me, says, hey, look, you need to give up your football career because you're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's only going to bring misery and pain. So he said, your sport's going to be basketball. Because I went from – this is a crazy how I grew. I knew that I was going to be tall – because my mom and dad were tall, my brothers were tall, but I kind of had a, a late growth spurt. So my freshman year, I was about six foot tall, my freshman year, which is tall, okay? But from my that summer between my ninth grade year and my sophomore year, I grew six inches. Wow. Six inches over six. the summer. That is, And I didn't even know I was growing until it was time for my mom to go get me some school clothes. And so she was buying the normal size, and I was looking like the Incredible Hulk. The pants were above the ankles. The shirts were all up by my, you know, up by my uh, uh, elbows. So I was kind of outgrowing everything, and my knees always hurt. Like, my, my joints always hurt. And so I didn't really know I was growing that fast. And everybody in my house is tall, so it doesn't look abnormal. You know what I'm saying? But then when I got around the other kids at the high school level, everybody's, oh, my God, the teacher's like, oh, my God, you grew. And I'm like... Oh uh, yeah, I think I did. <laughs> now you went to um, went to college in Oklahoma. So how yes. how did that happen, or was that just natural? No, it wasn't natural. Uh, I was heavily recruited. I got pretty good at basketball as we were going through that. Um, I got pretty good at basketball. I was one of the top recruits in the nation, and I was going to my initial uh, university. I was going to the University of Maryland, and the reason why I chose the University of Maryland was because I was a big North Carolina and DePaul fan, okay? Those were my two main choices that I really wanted to go to school. North Carolina one, uh, uh, DePaul two, okay? Maryland wasn't even in the picture. And the reason what happened was, was that when my two top schools, they kind of got taken away from me because North Carolina wanted me to sign my junior year in high school and not go on my college visits. And I, I said, no, absolutely not. I want to get on a plane because I'd never been on a plane before. And I wanted to go on my visits. And so they said, well, we couldn't promise you a scholarship next year. And I, my thought process, what if I'm better next year? You know, what if I'm better? How are you not going to offer me a scholarship? You're going to offer me a scholarship as an 11th grader, but not as a 12th grader. Well, you know, there, you know, as you know, North Carolina is a factory. They only have like one or two scholarships a year. It's like the Willy Wonka and the golden ticket. You only get a couple. And if you didn't get that golden ticket when they gave it to you, you're not getting it. So they didn't recruit me my senior year. Uh, DePaul was the second choice because I liked their uniforms because they always wore their uniforms outside. They never, it was untucked. I thought that was the coolest look. And uh, I was a big Ray Meyer fan. You know, Ray, Ray, Ray Meyer recruited me. And I really liked talking to him. Man, it was like talking to your grandfather, man. You just felt at ease. You know, you just felt like you and Bill, you know this, you recruited, you know, some of these guys, you know, they're like snake oil salesmen. They come to your house and tell you all these promises and all this stuff. And 
you, you know it does, they don't ever deliver, you know, but Ray Meyer was one of those guys that you felt comfortable when he came in your house. He felt comfortable when he talked to you, like he was telling the truth. But then what happened was, if you remember, Ben Wilson, the Chicago schoolboy legend, got killed that year, my senior year in high school. And so I had a recruiting trip coming to DePaul, and I knew Rod Strickland. Rod Strickland ended up going there. And uh, Ben Wilson, I had played against all these guys in AAU. And so I felt comfortable if I didn't go to Carolina, which they didn't give me a scholarship offer. I felt confident going to, you know, DePaul. But after Ben Wilson got killed, then it was kind of like my mom's like, no, nah, you're not going to Chicago. They're killing kids. So she made me cancel my she made me cancel my visit. I was devastated and uh, I couldn't go to DePaul. So then here's a funny story. So my high school girlfriend that I've been dating for two years, we were going to be a package deal when we when I, wherever school I was going to go to. This is young love, puppy love. You know, she was going to go with me. It was a package deal. So if I went to any school, she had to go. So she she was all on board. So I, I picked Maryland because Maryland was the best ACC team at that time next to North Carolina. They had Lynn Bias, Adrian Branch. They had a really good squad. And um, I felt like, okay, North Carolina, since you didn't give me a scholarship, I'm going to go to a team that's going to play you four times a year, and I'm going to give you the business. So that's why I chose Maryland. And then I went down on my visit, and the worst thing I could have done on that visit was take my mom. That was the first and only visit she went on. And Maryland, you know, they the coaching staff and the family knew to get to me, you had to get to Miss Lois King. And they got to Miss Lois King. So when we left Maryland, she was like, you're going there, you know. And I, I was kind of waffling back and forth, probably 60% I was committed to them. So um, my, my high school girlfriend said she'd go. And the night before the national signing date, which was on a Friday, so so – uh, Tuesday night, my girlfriend comes in and, you know, she's, she's in the car and I'm saying, Hey, you ready to go to Maryland? You ready to go? Cause I knew nobody in Maryland. She would have been the only person I know. So I, I felt comfortable with that decision. So she's, uh, you know, I, you know, how girls are, she started crying, fidgeting a little bit. And then she started crying and she's like, I can't go. It's too far. It's too far away from my parents. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. This was a discussion. You, we've been, you, you've known about this for weeks. If you wanted to change your mind, you should have told me. And I said, what am I supposed to do now? She's like, well, don't go. I don't want you to go. And I said, well, where do you want me to go? Where, where do you want me to go? I'm supposed to sign on Friday. The coaches in Maryland were in town because they had heard that I was ready to flip my signing deal. Like I was, I was ready to change my commitment. So they came early. They were taking me out to dinner. They were hanging out at my house. I mean, basically living in my house, making sure that I was still going to Maryland. So then my girlfriend says, um, I want to go to the University of Oklahoma. Oh, Bill, that wasn't even in my top five. They weren't even in my top five. They weren't even, they were, my mom hated Oklahoma. She hated Billy Tubbs. She hated everything about Oklahoma. She, she did not want me to go there. So I had to go in and tell my parents and say, hey, look, look I decided I'm changing my commitment. I'm going to University of Oklahoma. Of course, that didn't sit well with my mom and dad. And uh, that caused some major strife between the family. And uh, my dad said, well, you know what? You're going to make a man decision. So uh, you're going to make a decision. You're going to call the coaches in Maryland and you're going to tell them that you're not coming. And I'm like, no, you're my dad. You're supposed to do that. <laughs> you're the adult. You're supposed to do that. And he goes, no, you, you, made, a, you made a grown up decision on your own. So now you act like a grown up, call your coach, be a man and tell him in his face that you're not coming. So that was probably one of the most difficult calls I've ever had to make uh, to Lefty Giselle. And, and he was another good coach that I would love to play for. And uh, I had to break the news to him and say, coach, you know, uh, I'm not going to go to Maryland. I'm going to University of Oklahoma. And they were devastated. They were really devastated. Every time I've seen uh, Sherman Dillard, who was an assistant coach there, who now is assistant at University of Iowa, or if I see Lefty Giselle, they every day they tell me every time they see me, we could have won a national championship if you would have came. And I was like, but they said you made a great decision because you went and played for a national championship in Oklahoma. So it kind of worked out. So and wait a minute. And then following a girl to the University of Oklahoma, the girl who made me change my commitment, we broke up two weeks into school. So if any young people are listening to this conversation, 
Do not follow your girlfriend anywhere. <laughs> Make a decision based on yourself. Wow, you must have really been a love. Now, let me ask you, what? Now, now the coaches, when you made the call over there in Oklahoma, they had to be thrilled. Yeah, they were. You know what, Bill? Here's a funny story about that. So they had no scholarships available for me. They had already gave it out. So when I called them, of course, they're celebrating. They're, they're excited. You know, we got a top recruit coming. The number one player in Oklahoma is coming, da, da, da. But, oh, my goodness, we have no scholarships. Well, their attitude was we'll figure it out in August when he gets here. So, miraculously, a scholarship appeared when I came to the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> I don't know who's they, I don't know whose scholarship they took. <laughs> but I'm feeling bad about it right about now. I took somebody's scholarship. I don't know, but it's not my responsibility as a coaching staff. Ain't my, I'm just a player. But they took somebody's scholarship, and that player was gone when I got there. I just saw him on a picture. I'm like, hey, where was that guy right there? Is he a senior? No, he was a freshman. They they, they took his scholarship. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> that might be my scholarship. Hey, talk, talk about some of the players who were there, uh, the University of Oklahoma. And talk about your best years at Oklahoma. Well, I mean, you know, I was really close to Wayman Tisdale. And uh, had he stayed, he left uh, his junior year, which would have been his senior year would have been my freshman year. And they, they were coming off an elite eight appearance where they got beat by Memphis State, which is now Memphis University. And um, so he was leaving as I was coming in. And he told me, I used to see all the stuff Wayman got. You know, Wayman had a nice El Dorado. Wayman had a nice, he was living the high life. So that even, that even made my decision even better because I'm like, I'm going to get this stuff. And so Wayman always tell me, he said, hey, look, he's like, if you perform, you do what you're supposed to do, this, this all going to be you. So I'm like, okay, cool, right. And uh, so I played, I played with Anthony Bowie, who played in the NBA. Right. I played with Harvey Grant, who's Horace's twin brother. Yep. Uh, Mookie Blaylock, who also was a, an NBA player. Uh, Ricky Amazing Grace, uh, who's our point guard, who ended up going playing overseas in uh, Australia, who's been on the Australian national team and won, won the bronze medals and stuff over there, uh, coached by the great Billy Tubbs. Um, you know, that that was a wonderful experience for me. If, if anything got me ready for the NBA game, I would say playing for the University of Oklahoma because of the style of play that we play. We played an up tempo, running gun type of uh, type of offense, and uh, you know that really helped my game out because you know even though I could post up, I also could play out on the floor. I also can make decisions with the ball, and you know it just prepared me for the NBA game where we you know uh, we played defense. You know we got after people, we pressed, we trapped. Um, so it really got me ready for the NBA game. The only thing that it didn't prepare me for, we didn't run pick and rolls. I didn't know how to run a pick and roll when I first got to the Bulls. When I came in on my workout with the Bulls, you know, pre-draft workout, uh, Johnny Bach, I'm the great late Johnny Bach says, hey, hey, uh, we want you to run a pick and roll and we want you to dive to the basket. And I just looked at him like a deer in headlights. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, can you explain what you're talking about? He's like, what do you mean? Explain what I'm talking about. I go, a pick and roll. What is that? And he goes, you got to be effing kidding me. No, where'd you say you were from? And I'm like, Oklahoma. He said, oh, Oklahoma. That just, that, that tells me everything I need to know right there. And I'm looking at him like, dude, we just, our offense was throw the ball inside, inside first, outside second. No pick and roll. And that was the one part of the game I didn't really understand, but I learned it really quick. So your senior year, you're about to get drafted. Um, what are you thinking? What are some possible teams you're thinking that you're going to go to? Well, Bill, that year was really a crazy year because um, I probably, I thought about coming out my junior year after we went to the national championship game. And I felt like, you know, I, I, talking to scouts and talking to NBA people, my, you know, my, you know, that my coach was talking to that I would have been anywhere between, you know, 10 and 20, you know, but if I stayed another year, I'd be a lottery pick. And so I had a decision to make, you know, I was having so much fun at the college level that I was like, yeah, the pros can wait, you know, not thinking about injury or something could happen that could derail that, 
possibility. Because when you're a young kid, you know, 19, 20 years old, you think you're invincible. You're not even thinking about injury and all this kind of stuff. And so I go into my senior year after a Final Four appearance, uh, went to the Olympic trials, made it to the final cut of like 100 kids, made it to like 14, and I pulled my groin. Had I not gotten hurt, I'd been on the Olympic team. Um, so I was I was feeling really good about myself going into my senior year. And then um, I ended up breaking a finger probably four games into my senior season, which required surgery. And so when I went to go to the doctor, the orthopedic surgeon, he says to me, he says, all right, Stacy, um, here's your options. My mom was in there and here's your options. We can put pins in it. You'll be ready to play in a week or so. He said, but the problem with the pins is that if someone hits it, it, you know, you jam it again, we'll be right back in here. So, and your second option is to have surgery and you might, we might be able to get you back by tournament play. Well, I'm thinking, I'm, put, I'm looking at the numbers, Bill. That's like 30 games. Like, I all I see is dollar signs dropping. <laughs> to team to team, everything's dropping. I'm, I'm going from possible top five, you know, top five pick to now I might go into the second round if I'm even able to play at the end of the year. I was like, oh, man. So my mom, I was going to go with the pins. Coach Tubbs wanted me to go with the pins, but my mom goes, no, put the screws in. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, it, this is more important to get the, the finger healed properly. We'll worry about all the other stuff later. And I'm looking at it like, that's easy for you to say, Ma. That's easy for you to say. I, I want to play now. So I end up getting, getting screws put in my finger. And so I had to do this grueling rehab. And here's the funny thing, Bill, this is, this is, you know, when you get that Wally Pip story, you know, <laughs> you know, so I go out with injury. My backup comes up behind me and is putting up the same numbers that I'm putting up. I mean, just killing people. And I'm sitting over there like, oh, hell no. I got to get working. I got to get, I got to find a way to get back sooner because this dude is balling. So, so I'm sitting there saying they're going to forget all about me. So I go to rehab. I'm going to rehab. I get out of class in the morning, um, you know, like 11 o'clock because all my classes were early. And I would go to the orthopedic surgeon and uh, rehab like 10 hours a day, just in there constantly. Then I would get the key to the gym and I would learn how to shoot right-handed hooks, you know, stuff around the basket. And then I would have this protective uh, thing on my finger that looked like a corn dog. So in order for the finger not to get jammed, you know, this thing set off like a freaking corn dog. So I had to learn. And, you know, Bill, your fingertips are important to feel the basketball, you know, especially your index finger, because you want to feel when you let that ball go, there's a certain feel that you're accustomed to. So I had to relearn how to shoot the ball without this index finger. It was more these three fingers. And it was tough. But I got back. I missed four games. And the dude who was playing in my role Averaged about 26 points and 10 rebounds in those four games. But they were playing against Sisters of the Poor, though. So, so I come back early. I come back months early. So Tub says to me, <laughs> Tub said, hey, look, we're winning with this guy. He, <laughs> I don't know if I want to make the change. I'm like, what? I'm like, man, man, you better put me back in that lineup. So we, we, we have a, a national televised game against uh, – uh, North Carolina Charlotte was my first game back and they had a couple of pro prospects on that team. We we're playing on the NBC. And so I was coming off the bench. So he had me come off the bench, which I didn't like, but I said, you know, whatever, man, this guy's been playing good. I'm a team player. Let him play. So he struggles. He struggles big time, you know, not hitting shots. He's getting killed on defense. So Tubbs says, all right, go get him. I'm like, oh, now you need me. Now you need me. Okay. So I go out there with a bad finger, bum finger, the first play of the game, guy shoots the ball, I'm standing there, and the whistle blows. So this dude named Cedric Ball, he grabs my, my surgically repaired finger and pulls it for no reason. Like, there's the play stopped. I'm just, you know, I'm just looking. All of a sudden, I feel a big tug on my finger, and my finger is on fire. And I, and I turn over to him, I said, dude, if you do that again, I'm going to knock the hell out of you. I said, why'd you do that? He said, my coach told me to hit that finger, hit that finger. I was like, wow. And they were really trying to go at me. And I ended up having like 36 and like 15. So I was back, Billy C. I was back. 
talk about your first impressions of being drafted to the Chicago Bulls. Wow. I tell you, the, the whole draft process uh, was uh, was kind of like it was it, it was all all factor. I mean, every every bit of it from going to go visit the teams to the interview process. Uh, I remember I remember coming to the Bulls <laughs> and uh, the Bulls had the sixth pick. And so there was no way in the world I thought I was coming to the Bulls. I thought I was going to get drafted by Sacramento. That was the I knew I was going to go. It was either one or six. I know I wasn't going anywhere in between. So, um, you know, two, you know, it was Danny Ferry with the Clippers. Three was, I think, Sean Elliott with San Antonio. Uh, four was, uh, five was J.R. Reed. And four was Glenn Rice in Miami. So two through five all had special needs. They needed those particular players at those positions. They didn't really need a forward, power forward. So I knew I wasn't going anywhere in that group. Um, so when the Bulls brought me in the workout, I, I told my agent, I go, it's a waste of time. Why am I going to that workout? I'm not going to be there at six. He goes, well, you never know. He said, they, they just won 50 games. It's Michael Jordan. Uh, you're going to be, you know, you might play with Horace Grant, who's Harvey Grant's brother, blah, blah, blah. And I, I used to follow the Bulls back in college because Harvey would always talk to Horace after games. They'd be on WGN. We'd watch them. And uh, so I knew the ins and outs about the Bulls. Uh, the inside information, not just as a fan watching the game, but having, you know, Horace's twin brother Harvey there to let me know what Horace is doing, what Horace thinks about playing with Michael. I knew all about that. So when I went on my, uh, my, uh, my trip, you know, I go out there and, and, and I'm, I'm doing these drills with Al Vermeil, the strength test, you know, all that stuff. And then I was doing court work. And so I told my agent said, don't do any court work. Don't do anything. Just just do the interview process. David Falk was my agent. He said, just do the interview process. You're a lottery pick. They already know you can play. You don't need to get out there. So once again, the late, great Johnny Bach comes. He challenges me. So he says to me, he says, hey, we want to do some court work. We want to, we want to see you run. We want to do uh, some post drills. Do you mind doing that? I said, I uh, I don't know, coach. You know, I'm not supposed to be working. Where are you? What are you? Uh, are you? Uh, are you? Uh, are you a P word? He gave me the P word. What are you? A big P? You know, I'm like, who is this dude? Like, who? Is, he's not even the head coach, and he's talking all this trash to me. He goes, "What's wrong with a little work? We just, you're not going to get any contact. We're not going to hurt you." He's like, "Come on, man. This is the NBA. Come on, let's let's see you work. We want to see you work." So I'm like, I felt challenged. So then I went and said, "Okay, cool." So. I start this workout, Bill, and I'm doing all these, these running three-man weaves to do some pulse moves, boom, boom. So Doug Collins was the coach at the time. And I really liked Doug. Doug, Doug had a great personality. He had the kind of personality I would like to play for. And so um, <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, I'm doing these, these post drills, you know, the mic and drill. You know, I'm doing, you know, crab dribble, middle, jump hook, right hook, all this stuff. So then all of a sudden, they say, hey, we're going to bring in some contact. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna give you a little contact, whatever. I'm like, I'm like, cool. So I'm thinking it was the coach, like it was gonna be one of the coaches, like Johnny Bach or Tex or someone with a little dummy pad to hit me. Well, it's not them. So we're at the old multiplex. So here comes this guy walking through, and you know, I'm thinking, oh man, that's Dave Corzine. They're bringing Dave Corzine to, to bang with me. Now you know how awkward that is, Bill. If here I am, the young lion who may get drafted here, and here's the old lion who's still playing. You think he's going to take it easy on me? No. <laughs> so so I'm thinking this is Dave Cuisine the whole time. So he's banging me. I'm doing post moves. He's banging me. He's beating me up. And I'm thinking, hey, dude, you know, ease up. Like, come on. <laughs> like, this is unnecessary. I'm talking really hard stuff, Bill. Like, I mean, really banging. I'm, I'm up in there laying the ball up or trying to dunk it. He's hitting me in the legs and knocking me on the ground. So I turn it over to him and say, hey, man, hey, hey, man, seriously, stop. Or there's going to be there's going to be trouble. <laughs> Basically, I said, I'm a kick here. I'm a kick here. You know what? So he said, shut up and play. So he told me, shut up and play. And he used the P word again. OK, now I'm challenged again. So I said, OK, cool. That's how we're going to play. So I get the ball. They throw the ball. I said, make that same move. So it was two dribbles in the middle, quick spin and then go baseline. So as I make the same move, he's banging me again hard. 
I turned and give him the old Bill Cartwright elbow in the kisser. <laughs> Hit him in the face. Grab dribble, dunk the ball. And then as the ball's coming out the net, he's on, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's screaming. So I take the ball and I throw it at him. I, and I said, why don't you play the P word? Boom. And he was like, oh, and he tried to get me. So they had to separate us. So I'm thinking Dave Corzine is trying to fight me. So they break it up. Boom, boom, boom. So Jerry's like, Jerry's like, Jerry's like, hey, go, go, go to the lock, go to the locker room, go, go change, go change, go shower and cool off. And I'm like, man, who, what did, why would y'all bring a dude like that in here anyway? That, that I'm, I might be playing his position and y'all bring him in to work me out. That's the that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So as I'm walking out to the to the shower in the multiplex, Eric Helen, who was the assistant string coach at the time, tells me. He's like, man, you're real feisty. He's like, man, you got you you you're not afraid to fight. I go, no. And he goes, he goes, you know, he goes, you know who that was, right? And I said, yeah, it's Dave Corzine. He's like, and he starts laughing, and everybody was laughing at the same time when they were when I kept calling him Dave Corzine. I'm like, Dave Corzine, stop fouling me, man. That's you know, that's BS. Stop fouling me. Everybody was laughing. Doug was hilarious about it. So then, <laughs> so so Eric goes, you know who that was. And I said, Dave Corzine. And I'm getting mad because you keep asking me the same question. So he's like, no. He said, have you ever heard of Phil Jackson? No. Who's Phil Jackson? He said, Phil Jackson won a championship with the Knicks. He's, he was, he's one of our assistants. He's a top assistant. I said, he's coaching now? <laughs> he's the coach now? He's like, yeah. And I'm the first thing, you know how the hourglass and the sand just drains out the hourglass? I'm thinking to myself, I am not getting drafted here. I just ruined any chance of ever getting playing for the Chicago Bulls because I damn near fought, fought the coach. So, so I go back to the dress room. I'm feeling bad now. So I come back in the little room. Phil's not there yet. So it's just Doug, Jerry, you know, Tex, and Johnny Bob. So, so Phil, you know, Jerry's sitting there and he's, he's talking to me. He's like, you know, he's like, you can't lose your composure like that. He's like, we play the Pistons. They're going to hit you way harder than that. And, and you can't lose your composure. I said, wait a minute, Mr. Krause. Let me just say this, okay? I said, first of all, I thought it was Dave Corzine, number one, okay? I didn't know it was an assistant coach. I would have never attacked assistant coach, okay? But I said, second, if you slap me, I'm going to slap you back. I'm just telling you right now that I'm just going to have to get ejected. So, you know, uh, Doug was in the background going, yeah, that's my kind of guy. That's the kind of guy we want. The guy that's tough, got balls. We want him. And I'm like sitting back there, and when you see the head coach is celebrating, but the general manager is mad at you, you can't celebrate. You're like, you're sitting there like a scolded puppy. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. But Doug's back there hyped about it. So then Phil comes in. You know, he's got a duck to get in, you know. And you know how I feel that walk feel has. <laughs> it's funny now because I laugh at him, and I probably got that walk now too. <laughs> so, so he comes in and says, uh, hey. Uh, Phil Jackson. And I'm like, hey, uh, Stace King, hey, I'm sorry, man. No, no hard feelings. No, no hard feelings. No hard feelings. So that that was the introduction to my first introduction to Phil. So were you surprised when you were drafted by the Bulls? <laughs> yeah, I, I was. But, you know, Doug took me to the airport. And, um, you know, Doug, Doug had assured me, he said, hey, look, I, I, I bet the house. If you're at six, we're taking it. That's what he told me. So I knew, but I still didn't think I was going to go six. I thought I made a huge impression on uh, on the Sacramento Brass, which I did. And the funny thing about that is, you know, that's when Bill Russell was the was the coach of Sacramento at that time, and they had Wayman Tisdale there already on the roster. So a couple of things went against me: is one because both me and Wayman from Oklahoma, Oklahoma, from Oklahoma were both left-handed. So they just assumed that we were both the same player, which we're not. One, I was bigger than Wayman. I was taller than Wayman. And I could, I was more, I could play different uh, positions where Wayman was a back to the basket and he could hit the 15, 18 foot jump shot. But I felt like I was more versatile. I could play the four and the five, which I ended up doing my career. So we would have never had a problem playing with one another, you know? So, and then, so when I went to my meeting in Sacramento, this is how I knew I wasn't going to Sacramento. We're in the meeting with uh, Jerry Reynolds and all these guys, right? You know, so Bill, Bill, Bill Russell, the great Bill Russell 
is in the back at, well, on like the head of the table. And so they're talking to me about, you know, what position I want to play, yada, yada, I, you know, defense, whatever. All of a sudden I hear this. And I'm like, who the hell is sleep? I look, I turn around to my right bill, look back at the end of the table, and the great, the great Bill Russell was copping Z's. That's when I knew I wasn't going to Sacramento. When the head coach is not asking, asking the questions, nor is he paying attention, I knew I wasn't his guy. But I was glad because you know what? Even though I like Sacramento, and I probably would have been, you know, just coming from the wave that I came from Oklahoma, I probably would have been a 20-plus a game scorer there, but I never would have won. I never would have been in position to win. I would have scored a lot of points, never made it to the playoffs, never experienced the things that I experienced in Chicago. And that's the one thing I'm very thankful for because at the end of the day, it's never about numbers for me. It was never about scoring 25. Even though I was a big-time scorer at college, um, it was always about winning. I, I, I wanted to win. Um, you know, I, I cried for weeks after losing a national championship to Kansas uh, my junior year. I was heartbroken because I know how hard it took to get there and what we had to sacrifice as a, as a, as a team. Um, we were, you know, we finished 35-4 and four that year. We lost four games that season. You know, we beat Kansas three times that year before the national championship game. So, uh, and we were, we were probably one of the best college teams in the history that never won. Like if you were ranking like, the, we're, we're in some polls is like in the top 15 of greatest college teams. That that team assembled in, in 88 was, was a nasty team and we didn't win it. So I've always wanted to be on winning teams. I don't care about my stats. I didn't care about all that. I knew what I could do. But when I came to Chicago, you know, I was around a bunch of guys that had the same mindset that I had that, you know, Bill, you know, Paxson, you know, of course, Michael, Scotty. But, you know, we had a team full of guys that were that only cared about winning. You know, they weren't cared about. We didn't care about stats. We didn't care who got the glory or who got the most attention because we felt like I know I felt like this. and Bill probably felt the same way. It's like when we're winning. The pie, there's enough pie for everybody. Some people may get more, more pieces than others, but, but we're all going to get some pie. And that's how, you know, when you look at how all of us have turned out after our basketball careers have played out, like all of us all off those teams in the first dance are very successful, very successful doing other things. And not just, not just you know, being basketball players, but very successful in life as, uh, you know, as fathers, you know, husbands um, and other professions. And to play with such a great group of guys that had like super basketball IQ, you know, um, that's one thing I always felt I had was high basketball IQ, but playing with like Bill and, and John Paxson, you know, and, and Scotty Pippen and MJ, you know, you saw like it made you enhance your IQ. It made you become even more, have more basketball intelligence. Like I learned so much about how to play post from Bill Cartwright than anyone ever could have taught me. Like I learned how to defend certain guys. I learned how to use my quickness and angles to defend certain people where now when I got into coaching, I was able to pass that knowledge on that I had learned from the best guys. I felt I was able to pass that on to guys. I coached. Can I, can I say something though? How did you know, of course, the Bulls, when you were drafted, had Michael Jordan and, you know, they didn't have Bill yet and they didn't have other people. How did you know that that culture was more conducive to winning than, say, Sacramento, which had Bill, Car which had Bill Russell, who had won more championships than anybody? You know, you knew then that that wasn't a culture that you wanted to embrace? Well, what you, what you see a lot of times with guys who, who won at, at certain levels – not always are guys who can teach winning. You know what I'm saying? There's been a lot of successful guys who were great players and played on great teams. But then when they were put in positions to actually coach and teach people, they didn't have the same success. You know, uh, of all the basketball players that I look back as, that were successful as coaches and that were successful as players, you look at Larry Bird comes to mind first. You know, Larry Bird, great player, 
but was also a very good coach. He took a team to the, the finals, the Western Conference, I mean, the Eastern Conference finals. They were a thorn in the bull's side when he was a coach there. Um, you know, you, you go down the line. Isaiah had some success, a little success as a coach, you know, but uh, Bill's, Bill's first year was my first year. So we all kind of came in together. Like, so Bill, Bill, you know, the big acquisition for, for the Bulls was not just the draft picks. You know, they, they, got, they got a center they, they desperately needed. You know, they got rid of a popular player in, in uh, you know, in uh, Charles Oakley. And, you know, Bill came over and to run that offense that they that it would end up being the triangle, you know, Bill was the key piece to that. They needed a guy that could hold the post because the triangle offense, you know, predominantly you have to have a good post player that can hold the post because the ball's initiated most of the time through the center. And if you got a guy that can hold the post and read cuts and read, you know, what the defense is doing, because that offense is not an offense you come down and call a play. You don't come down and say, hey, run, run two down or run four twist, you know, like most NBA offenses. This NBA offense, the triangle offense is based off of how the defense plays and how they're playing you. If I can't get the ball into the entry to the wing, what do I do? You can't say, hey, 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 guy, come over here. I need to give you the ball. It's like, okay, that's not open. I go somewhere else. And it's instinctive. I always likened it to Tai Chi, martial arts, okay? Every day you're doing all this, you know, you're doing all this stuff, breathing and all this stuff. And you, and, you know, you get impatient with it because you're sitting there saying, especially young guys, you're like, man, this is why are we doing this all the time? Like, we're not we're not sparring. We're just, you know, we're just doing this all day long. But then when the moment comes in the game or when you have to use it, someone's attacking you, you know what to do. And it's the same thing in the triangle. We used to work. Bill will tell you, we used to work at least an hour a day just on fundamentals. Two hand chest pass. I mean, things you teach little kids in camp. We were learning. We were doing that as as professional athletes. And Tex Winter, you know, the late great Tex Winter, is um, was a stickler in his offense about the fundamentals of the game. You know, making the right read, making the right pass, a pass, your pass leading to someone else scoring, a simple bounce pass on a baseline. So a guy, all he has to do is get it and go up with it instead of fumbling it because you gave him a bad pass by his shoelaces. So all this fundamentals, you know, passing under duress, you know, with a guy in your face giving you defense and knowing how to step through bounce pass. I mean, all these fundamentals that we were taught all at the same time. So Bill coming from New York is my first year. B.J. Armstrong's first year, you know, Will Produce, you know, that was his second year. So when all these when all these guys are coming in here, you know, we're all learning this offense at the same time, and which made it really really special because we all were on the same timeline as far as this offense getting perfected, the way to win championships. And you know, I'm telling you, when you go to war, when you go to war, you got to be able to count on the man to your right. And the man to your left, and then your generals, the one like Phil Jackson, who I, who I feel like never gets the credit he deserves as being a great coach per se, because they feel like he's had so much talent. Oh, it's easy to win with Michael Jordan. Well, no, it's not easy to win with Michael Jordan. Ask the other coaches who coached before. How many titles did they win when they coached Michael? You know, same thing when they had Kobe in L.A. How many championships before Phil went out to L.A. did did they win? You know, with Kobe and Shaq zilch okay so that man deserves a lot of credit for being a great coach and a great orchestrator and the one thing i will say about phil is that he had a great understanding of his team you know he had a pulse of his team that's the one thing i took away from him as far as when i got into coaching is to understand my players outside of basketball you know what they do in their daily lives because we you know you see them every day you know, for basketball, you see him every day on the road, you see him every day, you know, when we're in different arenas, but I want to know about your family. I want to know how your kids are doing your wife. You know, I want to know, Hey, did you read this book? Did you know, did you, are you watching this, you know, this politics, you know, he, he had a pulse of his team. And that's the one thing I really tried to emulate when I got into coaching was to understand my players outside of just being basketball players, because it also shows you as a player, that that man took the time to find out something about me. 
he took the time to to understand me more than just being a basketball player. Hey, Stace, talk about talk about how the Bulls continue to get better every year, and what were some of the main factors in us winning those three championships? Well, I, I go back to you know my first introduction to the to the the Piston rivalry was my first year as a rookie. I, I thought we had a good enough team uh, to mm-hmm. beat Detroit that year. And that was the year that Scotty had the migraine headache and John Paxson missed uh, game seven in Detroit with a, a hurt knee because he hurt it in game six. I thought we were talented enough to win it then. Um, but we just we had to get over that mental. There was a mental block and it wasn't with everybody. It was more with the younger players. You know, the veteran players, Bill, you know, Michael, you know, Pax, those guys mentally, they knew what it took. They knew. But guys like myself, who was a rookie, B.J. Armstrong, a rookie, we didn't know what it takes. We didn't know. We were just following the big dogs lead. We're puppies following the big dogs. Okay, but at the end of the day, we, we can't be puppies when you're playing in the game seven. <laughs> you can't be a puppy when you're in the Eastern Conference Finals. You got you to gotta step up. And, and I felt like after that game, we were sitting in a locker room in Detroit in uh, Auburn Hills. I, I felt like for – Every man, I mean, there, there was guys, you know, I mean, I could tell how bad it hurt everybody. Like you had guys, grown men, they were crying. Guys were really heartbroken. It, I could see it in everybody's face that this really hurt, that everybody cared. And so I knew that summer we kind of made a commitment because before that we kind of worked out in like little clicks. Like we'd work out like two guys here, three guys over here, one guy over here. We didn't do a lot of stuff together, but we all got along. We all, Bill will tell you, we were tight. We were all close, but we weren't as close than we were as we won those championships because we had to make a choice then and there. Like we have too many guys going in different directions. We all want to go to the same goal, but we're going in different directions to get there. We all need to, to like, like super friends. We need to come together and go in the same direction. And I thought after that, that Pistons uh, uh, game seven loss, I thought that was that summer we came back together. We all worked out together. We all did tempo runs together. I mean, we all were in the gym at the same time, which is, which was rare. You know, I mean, I know my first year, Bill was always in there. Bill was like clockwork. You know, Bill was, he was like the veteran players were always there, but the younger players always came in in our own time, our own, I'm not getting up at eight, da, 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 da. You know, the veteran players, like they know because they got families and kids. Let me go get eight o'clock, get my workout in two hours, go have lunch and I'm home. Where us, you know, we're, we don't have kids. You know, we're like, I'm not waking up till one I'm not going there until afternoon. You know, that's what I was thinking. So we would go in there and, you know, we're messing around. We we joke and, 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 and have a good time. The veteran players like Bill and Pax and, you know, Scotty and those guys, they were actually working to get better, working on their bodies. Whereas we were just going in there like having a good time. That was our social hour. I think we spent more time my first year laughing and giggling than we did working out. And it proved – it proved like, hey, we need to change the way we think. We need to start thinking like these guys do. Like, you know, Bill, for instance, and Bill will tell you, like, I'm a prankster. Like, I like to joke around and stuff. So, oh, do you? you know, Bill, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my MO. So, Bill, after every game, didn't matter if it was practice, after every single game, he would look like Frosty the Snowman. He would have so much ice on every part of his body. He's wrapped in, he's wrapped in, all this ice. And I used to come and laugh at him all the time. Ah, Frosty the snowman, look at all the ice. Da, da, da. You're old Bill. And he and he would say, he would say, hey, let me tell you something. Your time is coming. You, you're going to be in this ice. And I'd be man, get out of here. Because this is coming from a guy who never stretched. Like, I never stretched. I just played. And so to see veteran players, how they handle themselves. You know, I thought I knew everything at Oklahoma. You know, when you're the when you're the top dog in Oklahoma, you know, you don't have people pushing you or showing you how to do certain things. You're just kind of figuring it out as you go. But when you get to the pro level, there's levels to this, you know. And so as a young player, 
you know, I still had that Oklahoma mentality. I know everything. I'm not stretching. I'm, my body feels good. You'll never see me in ice. And then I would see Bill and Pax and them getting massages and treatments. And I was just like, man, why they do that? Like, are they that old? You know, but but they were preventive. It was preventive measures to allow them, one, to recover quicker, to play longer. And I didn't think that way at that time. But after I saw it, I was like, my next year, I was living in ice baths. I was I was I had I was just like Bill. You know, I'm like, I'm like 23 years old, 24. I got ice on the neck, ear lobes, wherever ice could go, that's where I put it. Thanks to Bill. Stace, can you talk real quick about uh, two guys, Al Vermeil and Jerry Cross? Two of my favorite people. Um, Al Vermeil, in my opinion, is was the is the greatest strength coach of all time and doesn't get the credit he deserves. A lot of stuff you see nowadays with all this personal training and all these machines and all. Al Vermeil was ahead of his time. Al Vermeil started all that. OK, and I wish Al Vermeil would have patented all that stuff, Bill, when he was doing all that stuff, because now people have come and basically taken his ideas and now they they're making a lot of money off of it. But Al never did it for the money. He did it for the, the fact that he loved working with us individually, us as a group. Um, and he's a big reason why we won so many championships because of his offseason workouts and and being able to prolong older guys careers being able the, the the years we won the championship we had the least amount of games missed as a group as a team so when you're when your players your 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 core players your starters are not missing games when other teams are sitting out because they got a toe jam or their fingers hurt and we're playing our you know 12 guys and we're just mowing you down and we're not missing games that's an amazing feat because of injury. We didn't have guys miss games for him. If Bill Cartwright missed a game, it was because Phil Jackson made him miss. And it would be one day saying like, hey, Bill, you're going to take two weeks off and want you to go to Disney World. And I'm like, looking at him like, and I'm licking my chops because I know when he's gone, I'm getting playing time. That's like 40 minutes for me. Woo, woo, woo. Bill, take another week off if you want, you know? And then Bill would come back and Bill would be fresh and be ready to go in the playoffs. That's when you need Bill. Like there is times, you know, when they talk about the Bulls in the 72 game, the 72 win season, and now you got Golden State who broke that. We could have easily won 72 games. Easily. There was one year I, 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 we had won 67. And that was the season where Phil was not concerned with that. Phil, we all wanted to go for it, but Phil was like, no, nah, it's not important. The ultimate goal is the championship. If we spend all our time, now look at Golden State. They will win 73 games, don't win a championship. So we felt like we could, but they didn't do it. You know, Phil pulled off the gas and was like, you know, we ended up winning 67 games that year, but we easily could have won 72 games. And then Jerry Krause, you know, uh, doesn't get the credit he deserves. And, and the one thing I will say, I watched the last dance and um, I found it entertaining, you know, um, like any other fan. But I, I thought it was some miscalculations in it. You know, I, I felt the portrayal of Jerry Krause was unjust. Um, I didn't think he got enough credit. And, I, I you know, I, I know where that was coming from. You know, Jerry was a guy that, you know, first of all, he was very, he kept everything close to the vest. He didn't tell you what his plans were. He didn't go to you and say, hey, Stacy, what do you think about this move? Or, hey, Bill, what do you think? No, he, he didn't do all that. Okay. He was a general manager. And he expected players to play. You do your job and play at your optimal best. I'm going to try to make sure that we get players in here that think the same way that we all thought. And because we're trying to win championships. And I think it rubbed people the wrong way. I think contracts back then rubbed people the wrong way. Um, but I thought Jerry's betrayal, if Jerry's name was West, he'd be the greatest GM of all time. Because think about this. He took two separate three-peat teams to world titles. The only constant in both those, those two championship teams was Scotty and Michael. Everybody else was different. The whole cast was different, okay? And I will say this, too. Had, had MJ not went to go play baseball, 
we probably would have won. I remember when we were sitting there and people after the first one, they were yelling, you know, two Pete. We went two. It was like, we're on six Pete, you know, and we'd all sit up on the at Grant Park going, man, these people, man, they have no idea how hard this is, you know. Um, but we very well could have won eight in a row because the two years that MJ was gone, that Houston won, that would have been Bulls. We would have won. People say, oh, you wouldn't have beat, you wouldn't have beaten uh, a large one. Let me just tell you this. We have Bill Cartwright, who is probably an underrated defensive player on some of the game's best offensive centers at the time. Okay, when the money was when the money was was on the table, I'm putting it on Bill that he would have been able to slow Dream down, and we would have had defensive coverages because that's one thing our coaching staff was really good at is that we made adjustments, not just quarter adjustments or halftime adjustments. We're making in-game decisions and choices to change the way we're going to defend somebody. So yeah, could, could, would Hakeem score 30? Yeah, probably, but he would have had a hard time scoring those 30. And then the other people on the team, I don't feel Houston would have had enough to beat us. And like I said, when you got, you got Michael Jordan, that's like an ace in the sleeve. You know, when the game's, when the game's over, they think you're ready to fold, you slap it on the table and then collect all the money. That's what we would have done. So not taking anything away from Houston. I, I, I think if, and I, I don't think our team would have broken up the way it did. I think guys would have stayed there at MJ not to go play baseball. I think Horace doesn't leave. I don't think Scott Williams leaves. So, you know, and then we would have added Tony Kukoc. I mean, it would have just kept on going. It would have just kept on going. And who knows? We might have been able to, you might have been able to challenge Boston for, you know, consecutive championships. I mean, you know, those are different eras. You know, um, you know, they didn't have the same kind of, you know, teams that we had to face. Um, but championship is championship. So, Stacey, you, uh, very lucky, very blessed, part of early in your career, as opposed to me. I got my championship in my 12th year. Um, you win three championships, and then now you're leaving the Bulls to go off and play Minnesota and Miami. What What's the difference Ooh. in being in those yeah. – two organizations than with the Bulls? Well, the difference, the difference, Miami was very similar because we had Pat Riley. So you had a good leader. You had a guy that was no nonsense, held the players accountable like Phil Jackson. And he was a winning coach at the Lakers in New York. You know, we had some classic battles with him in, in New York. So the mindset was the same. You know, it was just a different way of going about doing it. Like he, I can understand Bill now, why the Knicks could never beat us, you know, because now being by being behind, you know, behind the line, you know, the way that they practiced and the way that they prepared, they were just physically burnt out, you know, because, you know, when Pat got to Miami, uh, you know, his first year was my first year and he, he wanted to change the culture where guys had to buy in or they, they were getting shipped out, you know, and it was his way or the highway. And, um, you know, they traded, uh, they traded Glenn Rice, you know, um, for, for Alonzo Mourning. And he started building the team the way he wanted to build it. And, um, but he had the same mentality that, that Phil had, just a different way of going about doing it. But I can see why the Knicks didn't beat us. Because his practice sessions were, I mean, it was full go 24-7. I mean, there was no days off. I think I my first year with him, I think there was probably – Five days off total. We used to have to get tape for shoot arounds. Yeah. Wow. Tape for shoot around. Yeah. And do and if you if Bill, if your team came in, you say uh Bulls are not coming in for the shoot around day, they got in late. We're taking your hour in the shoot around. So we got a two hour shoot around. And we're going hard, physical shoot around, not like walk through, let's play the shooting game like we normally did. Let's shoot for money. Nah, nah, bro. It was straight up banging set screens fight over screens and i'm like man we play tonight like this is crazy but we did that every every single time and you had to tape for everything whether it be shoot around practices and then bill if you got hurt in a pat Riley practice like i hurt my ankle i sprayed my ankle third degree sprain in the game so i'm thinking okay i'm gonna do some pool work i think I think, okay, I can't, I can only do so much with a hurt ankle with a cast all the way up to my knee. They had me in hyperbaric chambers. 
If you've ever been in one of those, you know what that feels like. So I was in a hyperbaric chamber three nights a week trying to get back. The, if, as long as the team is practicing on the floor, that's how long I have to be doing something on the sideline, whether it's the UBE machine, full speed, riding a bike. I mean, they're taping my foot to a bike. I'm like, yeah, I can't even get my foot in the strap. They got me taped to a bike. And I'm going just as hard as the players are. I mean, I'm really working just as hard as the player. And it got to the point, Bill, where it's like, man, I was like, cut this damn cast off. I'll go out there with a bad foot. I'd rather go out there. I'd rather go practice and do this crap. You know, you, that's how hard it was. And so he, his is a little bit different. But but leaving, leaving Chicago, going to Minnesota, I always tell kids this, man, is that the grass ain't always green on the other side. Okay? So <laughs> – <laughs> so I leave, I leave, I leave Chicago, which I consider the penthouse. I'm in the penthouse floor, nice furniture, great view, awesome. I go straight from the penthouse to Minnesota, which was the outhouse. Okay. I went from the penthouse with no elevator and just fell right down the elevator shaft. I, I had guys, I, I love my teammates, but when you're around professional veteran guys like you, there's just a sense of professionalism that you carry yourself with because you learn from really good pros. So I was very blessed to have, you know, Bill, Pax, Charles Davis, Craig Hodges, uh, Ed Neely, um, you know, Scotty, Horace, you know, I can name a hundred players that we had in those years we won that I learned from and that were consummate pros. Our coaching staff was consummate pros. So everything we did was professional. So when I went to Minnesota, First day I'm there, Bill, uh, Sidney Lowe was the coach. So he says, hey, we're going to walk through. Do you want to play tonight? I know you got to take your physical. If you pass your physical, do you want to play? I go, oh, hell yeah, I want to play. He goes, all right, good. He says, because uh, you're going to be able to score here. You're going to be able to do things you couldn't do in, in Chicago. So, you know, that's all I need to hear, Bill. I'm going to get more opportunities. Yeah. So I, so I take the physical. He says, all right, we want you to – we're going to have a shoot around. And once you uh, – we get there about 10 o'clock. We'll walk through some plays, get you acclimated so you can play against Houston tonight. I'm like, cool. So you know how we do it, Bill, in Chicago. So if it practices at 10, you're there like 830 because you get your work in, <laughs> treatment, and then you get ready to go on the floor. So I get there at 830. I'm all bright eye. I'm ready to go. Nobody there. Strength coach ain't there. The trainer ain't there. No one's there. So I'm like, dang, where's everybody at? So here comes about 930. Here comes Mike Brown, the brown bear. He comes running in. I said, Mike, what's up, man? Like, hey, says, can we do a better? I said, where's everybody at, man? Practice at 10. It's like 930. He goes, oh, man. He said, man, you ain't in Chicago no more. He like, they come when they want to. I said, what? He said, yeah, they come if they want to. They may not even come today. And now you got to remember, we're playing with, I got J.R. Ryder, Christian Leitner. You know, I had that team. And, um, so sure enough, we got we got to walk through. None of those players show up. One player showed up. It was Mike Brown and I think wow. it was uh, Ellis Frank. So it was two players, me, and then we had to pick a lady off the treadmill because we were in a health club. She was on the treadmill. We said, "Hey, can you come down and play as a player and, and walk through this with us?" Oh, sure. She stopped running on the treadmill. Bill and came down. We had a, we had our equipment manager who had to come out there and be a player. And I'm just sitting there this whole time thinking, this is crazy. Like, I've never, this is not like, I, I've never experienced this. You know, practice at 10 o'clock, you're there at 830. Everyone's on the floor. No one's sitting out. No one's late. You know, people just know because time is precious, you know, at the NBA level. You know, so I, I was caught off and then the losing, Bill. I mean, I remember we were getting beat by Houston that night. I think I had like 25 points and like 15 boards. And uh, Clyde Drexler and Mario Ellie and those guys were running by, you know, you ain't got black Jesus on your team now. Oh, yeah, you on the have not. Yeah, yeah, where's black Jesus at now? You had it too good in Chicago. So they were really, like, giving me crap because I'm playing with some other people besides MJ. And I, and I, I didn't really think of it that way, like how many people actually hated us because we were winning. You know, so they gave me the business. Every time we play somebody, I'd hear, where's Black Jesus at? Where do you got the whip day on the team now? I'm like, oh, my God. You guys are killing me. Hey, talk about, so you're in the NBA, and then now you play in the D-League. What, what is that like? 
Well, because I was coming back from overseas, and at that time, it was the D League was the CBA. So I would come back from overseas, playing overseas in Italy, and I wanted to get back to the NBA. So my agent was having a hard time getting me on teams because rosters were set and, you know, whatever. So he said, would you be opposed to going playing in the, in the CBA just to stay in shape, let teams see you? And, of course, I just wanted to play. I didn't look at it as being a bad thing. I was like, yeah, sure. It'd be sitting around the house and not being in shape when a team calls. So I went down there and played and uh, played like uh, I played like a half a season. And then I ended up getting called up. And it was it was um, I think it was the best thing for me because it, it really showed me like the appreciation and how you take for granted being in the NBA. You know, the, the lifestyle, the first class, everything. Like, we never carried our bags. There's always, you go to a hotel, the bailman gets it. You, you're in the CBA, you're carrying your own bags. You know, you're eating at Waffle Houses where we was eating at five-star restaurants at the NBA. You're traveling on vans and buses like the old AAU days when you get in the van and go places. So it was a humbling experience, but it was an experience that I, I really – needed to, to, to see and feel because I had an appreciation of what it takes to be an NBA player after going through that. And let me ask you, what led you, uh, cause you played, you played for a long time. What led you to want to coach? You know what? It's funny because, you know, Tex winner, I used to have real in-depth conversations with Tex about the triangle offense and, I would point things out to Tex and say, why do we run it this way? Why can't we, how about we run it this way? Now here's a kid from Oklahoma trying to tell a legend how to run his offense and just try to, you know, different ways to run it. And he used to laugh at me. He's like, nah, it'll never work. Da, da, da. I'm like, all right. So then, but he always told me, he said, I think you'd be a good coach. He said, you got a good, you have very good awareness. The IQ's there and you can, you can communicate. You'd be a great coach. And I'm like, Nah, Tex, I don't think I'm going to be a coach after dealing with – I see how y'all have to deal with some of these guys. I might want to punch a player if they disrespect me. He's like, no, nah, it's not about that. He says, you know, you get with the right people, put the right people around, you can be a great coach. I'm like, nah, can't do it. And so I never thought I would. And then Jerry called me, and he says to me, he says, um, hey, we got the radio gig uh, if you want it. We, I think you'd be good at it. And I said, nah, Jerry, I said – I'm not ready to do that yet. I'm, I'm going to jump into coaching my friend because Isaiah brought the CBA. If you remember that he bought the CBA and he was trying to hire as many NBA personnel people uh, he could. So he had reached out to me and said, I got an assistant coach's job open in Rockford. You know, would you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to try it, you know, because I was still young and I was probably 32, 33 at the time. And I just got out, just stopped playing. And um, so I said, yeah, let me try it. Because I felt like, Bill, I felt like the reason why I went into coaching first is because I wanted to stay around the game, you know. And yeah. you miss that camaraderie once you retire and you're not in that locker room anymore. You know about that. You don't, you don't have that same – those guys are your family. They're, they're your extended family. You're around, you're around guys' basketball team almost more than you are around your own family. You know, that's how much we spend, how much quality time we spend together. So I did miss that. I jumped into coaching and loved it. Loved it. Um, I was really good at it, too. I went over 70% of my games, took my team to the finals, put a lot of kids in the NBA. But the one thing that was happening was that, you know, I was losing time with my kids. Like, my kids were growing up, and, you know, I was missing events, and I was missing things, and I was like, I had to make an executive decision, you know, because you can't get those th you can't get those times back. I don't care how many videos are taken, how many pictures are taken. You're still not there. You're still not involved. So I decided that you know I'm gonna walk away from coaching. I'm gonna spend more time with my kids and go to their events and their sporting events, which I did. And then um, you know, and then we'll see what happens later on. But I coached there. I coached in the CBA four years, and it was the best four years ever. I had the best time, and I felt like had I stayed, I would have been an NBA head coach by now. And But I think the one thing – I have no regrets about my decision to not do it. Um, the one thing that's helped me, Bill, 
It's helped me in my, in my analyst work. It's helped me as a, as a TV broadcaster because not only do I have perspective as a player, what a player is thinking, I have that perspective of what a coach is thinking or what a coach is, is doing or what, what are you going to do on this timeout here? What are they coming out to do on this down two? What would you do? So I can see the game now in two different perspectives, which like just like when you first come in the league as a player, the game's 100 miles an hour. And you're like, meow, 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 meow. but as you go get older and more experienced, the game is like, shh, shh. so that's how it is for me as a broadcaster. It's, I see it in slow motion. I can see plays developing before they actually develop, which is really weird. I mean, it's probably hard to think, but Bill would know as a, as a, as a former coach and a player, you just have different perspectives of things. You see things totally different when you've been in those two roles. Yeah. Hey, talk about um, just. I'm, uh, I'm only gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna give you two guys. Okay. Who are the two best guys you've worked with? I know you probably can't even say that. Uh, that you enjoy working with because you you do a really good job, and everybody know you know you got your sauce on there on everything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who do you really enjoy working with and team well with? I, I really, I really enjoyed working with Neil Funk. First of all, Neil, Neil Funk is is the most underrated uh, broadcaster in the NBA. I mean, he first of all, you know, Johnny Mose, Chick Hearn, you know, you know, um, all these legendary, you know, older guys that are no longer doing it or they're passed away. You know, the one thing they all had going for them is is not only were they good at what they did. They had the voices, the Ben Scullys, you know, those voices that are identifiable no matter where they are, no matter what team they call, you know that voice. And it's like, hey, Ben Scully, Chick Hearn, Johnny Motes. Neil Funk has that iconic voice. When you hear Neil Funk on the radio, if you hear Neil Funk on TV, that iconic voice uh, that he has. And and, and his, his, you know, everybody thinks I'm like, I'm the funny man, you know, and I, and, and, and I make the broadcast go, but Neil Funk has, a, I mean, he has a, a really enabled me to be the broadcaster that I am because, you know, normally when you hear great calls, you know, big time calls, so-and-so made a three point shot. Oh, it's normally the, 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 the lead broadcaster that makes that, you know, you know, Marv Alberts, you know, those guys make those legendary calls. You know, Neil recognized early that I had a certain energy about me that probably he doesn't have, that he didn't want to be. He didn't want to do it. He's been doing it for 30 plus years. So he said, let me let this kid do this. Let, let me let him do those calls because he's got all this energy and he's, you know, he's a ball of fire. And he, he turned me loose and he allowed me to be who I am. You know, he didn't, he wasn't one of these old, you know, older guys that came on and going, hey, look, you're going to do it my way. Da, da, da. He wasn't one of those guys. And I've had friends who are in my role, who their partner they work with, they said that's what happened to them, you know. Um, but he was, he was, he's legendary. I hope he makes the Hall of Fame. Um, he really helped my career. I owe a lot to, to Neil. Um, he's, he's one of the best that I I've ever, he is the best that I ever worked with. And then I would probably go the second, the second best person is, uh, the guy I'm working with now, Adam Amin. Uh, he's coming from ESPN. He's a national guy. Uh, when I'm doing games with him, like he, he is probably like I was to Neil, like I made Neil younger. You know what I'm saying? When you got a young guy with all this energy, it makes you younger when you're an older guy. So now you feel like, oh, I, you know, 10 years have been shaved off. Well, I, I'm like Neil now. You know, I, I'm that older guy. And here comes this young, you know, upcoming, you know, broadcaster with all this energy. And now I'm like rejuvenized. I'm like, I got this, this, uh, this energy about myself. And I'm a natural energy guy. I mean, I almost, I should do a five-hour energy commercial and, and, and be, because that's me. I'm constantly in a bill to tell you. I'm constantly on, 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 I'm on all the time, you know? And so to have a young kid like Adam Amin uh, has just probably taken, you know, five years off my career, you know, when maybe I might've been thinking about retiring 
in a little bit because my partner Neil left, you know, um, now I feel like, oh, man, I mean, I could do this. I could do this longer, you know, because I've got a new energy level. He's funny. He's hip, you know, whereas like I'm, I'm hip. Like Neil, Neil was listening to Burl Ives. He was listening to, you know, he's listening to Bean Crosby type where I was the hip hop guy. I'm listening to rap, hip hop. Now I got a guy who's the same. He's hip hop rap. So we're, you know, we, we, we mesh very well together and he's got a great personality. I, I like the fact that we, we click, you know, and, and even though I've only worked with him before this year, I only did probably four games with him because we were auditioning different guys to replace Neil when he retired. Um, I feel much more comfortable with him now than I did in the, in the four games I did with him prior, but he's fun. Steve. Um, no, I thought, I thought this was a great interview. It's really great to get to know you, Stacy. I was just going to say, um, you talked a lot about what you learned from Phil Jackson, but what did you learn from Billy Tubbs in your career at Oklahoma that you took into coaching and broadcasting? He had a well, very dynamic personality. Yeah, Billy was a, Billy was a dynamic personality. I, I think a lot of my swagger came from Billy Tubbs because he was a coach that enhanced that in our players. Like, <laughs> here's a funny story. We're, we're in Kansas playing at an Allen Fieldhouse, which is legendary. And OU hadn't beaten Kansas in Kansas in a long time. And we had a super team. So we, you know, we're, you know, before we went there, he told us, he said, hey, look, if we beat Kansas in Kansas, we're going to go cut the net down. Now, understandably, this is the start of the Big 8 season. So no one has won the Big 8 championship yet. So there, you really can't do that. So we we beat Kansas. And so we go start to go cut. He go, go cut the net down. Go cut the net. So we started to go cut the nets down. Bad idea. Bad idea. Really bad idea. <laughs> We, we were pelted with, with, with hot dogs, coins, uh, ice. We were attacked by fans. We had to get a police escort off because we literally tried to cut the net down. But that's the kind of swagger that we play with. And, and, and so that's kind of where I kind of get it because, you know, my, my college coach, Billy Tubbs, allowed us to have a personality. Everybody on the team had nicknames. We had our nicknames on our on our back of our warm-up jersey. So when people saw you, like Harvey, Harvey Grant was the general, General Grant. You know, Mookie was Mookie. We had Ricky Amazing Grace. We had we had a white guy on our team named uh, Dave Seeger. His his middle name was Soul Man. So, <laughs> so we had we had all these mine was Sky King. So everybody would see us with our nicknames. And we were on TV a lot. I mean, we were on, you know, we we created uh, ESPN's Big Monday um, that they they currently have. We were on that almost every Monday. You know, Dick Vitale would be at our games all the time. We were on NBC. And back in those days, when you were picking colleges, you were kind of picking colleges on how many times you play on TV. But now everybody, every game's on TV. But back in those days, you was like, all right, uh, Billy Tubbs, how many times do you play on TV? Uh, and if you told me twice, uh, Next, <laughs> you don't play enough. I'm sorry, you don't play enough. Well, do so you think there was a method to his madness? Do you think that there was a reason he did those kind of things to give you guys confidence and and to just, hey, if you're going to beat these people, you can't be afraid of them, and you should almost have contempt for them. Yeah, I, remember I mean, because they used I mean, to listen, be accused I, I of remember, running up the score too. I, well, he got he always got accused of running up the score. So we, I remember we were playing a team, uh, Georgia State. And uh, we were beating them by 30, like killing them. And so one of their players comes over to the bench and he says to Coach Tubbs during the timeout, Tubbs is getting ready to pull us out. So the kid says, hey, Coach, uh, Tubbs, you know, he's, he's on his, you know, he's on his, um, you know, he's squatted down. He looks up and he goes, yes. And he goes, um, our coach wants to know if you'll call off the dogs. And so Tubbs looked at him. Okay. And so he turns back to us. He said, hey, their coach wants us to call. He's calling y'all a bunch of dogs. <laughs> Let's show them what greyhounds do. And so he says, if we don't beat them by 50 or more, we're running suicides after the game. Now, I'm sitting over there like I got like 25 points. So my thinking is, 
Well, if we go back out there, I can get 30 or 40. So yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go back out there. But then the other guys is like, man, come on, coach. Come on. Let, let some other guys play. I'm like, y'all, y'all, y'all be diplomatic all y'all want to. I'm trying to get 40. But we went back out there and beat him, I think, by 50. So we didn't have to run. But here's another story about him. Um, my sophomore year, I was ready to transfer from University of Oklahoma because I was unhappy with my playing time. Um, I was I was the sixth man, but I felt like I should be starting and I should be playing more. And so um, we were in the NCAA tournament and we played Pittsburgh with, uh, you know, Charles Smith and, and Jerome Lane. The year Jerome Lane broke the, the backboard in college basketball during that time. So Pittsburgh was – yeah, Pittsburgh was like the number five team in the country. And two of our seniors got benched because they broke curfew. So then I moved into the starting lineup. Well, in the starting lineup, I had like 19 points, like 10 boards, like six blocks. So it gets, gets us to the next round, to the Sweet 16 round. So I'm thinking my role is going to change now. Like, okay, I'm showing you I can play in big-time situations. Now it's time to let me play. So we played B.J. Armstrong and them in, uh, in Seattle up in uh in the tournament that's how that's my first introduction to the kid so he had a very good Iowa team so we played them in the sweet 16 game and they beat us I think it was 93 to 91 and BJ had a pretty good game they had Kevin Gamble Brad Lojas they had a pretty good squad and uh they beat us by like two and I played five minutes five minutes after playing so well in the previous games five minutes so on the plane ride home, I'm upset. I'm mad. You know, I'm sitting on the plane, and I was I had, I, I summoned my my academic advisor. His name was Rick Pryor. I said, Rick, I need to talk to you about you know getting my paperwork together. I'm transferring yada yada. And he's like, uh, No, you don't want to do that. No, no, no. I'm like, No, I'm done, man. I said, I, I can't. He, he I, I can't go another year playing in this role. You know. So he's like, he so he said, No, it's not a good choice, Stacy. You know. Just got to be patient. You know, all the stuff your parents would tell you. So he goes back there and goes and tells Tubbs in the back of the plane, like, hey, you, you might want to get up there and go talk to Stacy. Now, you got to remind you now, remind you that we were losing four of our starting five that year, the next year. They were going to be gone. They were seniors. So, and the recruiting class hadn't came in yet. So he didn't know who he's at. So right now, if I leave, you're definitely shorthanded. So Tubbs comes up to me. I got my big headphones on. And I see him coming out of, the, out of the corner of my eye. So I kind of act like I'm asleep. And so he comes by my headphones and he, he grabs my headphones like this and says, what are you listening to? That rap? And then he drops the head thing and smacks me in the ear. And I, I'm looking at him like, dude, I am not in the mood. I will toss your little butt off this plane. I'm not in the mood to be playing around with. So he says, you mind if I sit next to you? I said, all right, cool. Come on. So he sits next to me. He's, he's in by the window. And I really don't want to hear anything he's got to say. But I'm giving him respect because that's how I was raised. So I take my headset off and he asked me what I was listening to. I said, run DMC. He's like, that's trash. You should be listening to country. You're from Oklahoma. I'm like, oh, man. This conversation's already started off bad. So he's sitting there telling me, and just like what you would expect a coach to do to a disgruntled 19-year-old. You're going to play. This is your time. We know you can play. Next year is your year, yada, 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 yada. And I'm like, and he goes, I hear you want to transfer. I think that's a bad idea. You're going to play next year. You're going to be our starting center, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, coach, listen, I, I, you know, I just need some time. I'm going home and talk to my parents. He said, take some time to think about it, but I think it's a bad mistake. And so right before he gets ready to leave, he, t he puts his hand on my, on my thigh. And he's like, you know, he slaps my leg and he says to me, he says, hey, your future is bright, Stacy King. And he pauses. And normally when he tells you something, he's always got some little, some little extra to it. <laughs> so he goes, your future is bright, Stacy King. Just make sure you're wearing your sunglasses. And then he gets up and leaves. He ends the conversation on that. So I'm sitting there, not, not only am I pissed, not only am I pissed about the tournament and only playing five minutes against BJ in Iowa, you're going to end up, you're going to end the conversation with that. Leave me hanging. And he walks off and I don't see him again. So I go home to my parents and I tell my mom and dad, I'm going to transfer. My dad is a career military guy, you know, Sergeant. 
So you can only imagine what that conversation was like. So I go in there. My dad's in his little wife beater. <laughs> he's sitting at the table eating. And he's. I, I go, Dad, I said, I'm going to transfer. I'm going to leave Oklahoma. I'm, I think I'm going to go to Kansas. And, and he goes, no, you're not. You're not going anywhere. And I said, yeah, I am. He goes, no, you're not. He said, first of all, you made this decision. This is, we told you that we didn't want you to go there. You made that decision to go there, and now you're going to stick to it. I don't care if you play another second. You're going to finish the University of Oklahoma. You're going to graduate, and you're going to go get a real job. Whatever, whatever it takes, you're going to finish. And I'm like, oh, well, that wasn't what I really wanted to hear. You know, I was still mad about it. And at that time, you had to, if you were under a certain age, you had to have your parents sign off on the transfer. And my mom and dad wouldn't sign off on it. So Billy Tubbs really should thank my parents for making me go back to school. And then I came back the next year. Hey, I'm watching you. I got to watch my little puppy. You might try to sneak one in on me. Get over here. I'm watching you. So I go back that, I go back that summer. I tell Billy Tubbs I'm coming back to school. So, and, and Bill, you know this, like you have summer jobs, you know? So I went to school and uh, I had a summer job. So I go to one of my assistant coaches was in charge of the summer jobs. So uh, me and my girlfriend, who was my wife, who, that gave me my three beautiful boys. I had her with me. We had just started dating. So I was trying to impress her when I was going up to the coach's office and, and ask for a better job this summer. Cause other jobs I had was construction work and I was working in the hot sun. So I wanted like an inside job with air conditioning. So I go up to him and I said, uh, hey, Coach Mims, Mike Mims was his name. I said, Coach Mims, um, can I get an inside job this year? You know what he told me? This is what he told me. This, this is what I had to deal with in Oklahoma. Coaches with smart ass mouths. Okay, so this is what he tells me. He says, uh, are you uh, are you all American? Uh, no. He said, are you, are, you all, are, you, are you all conference? No. He said, you on the Olympic team? No, he said, well, you got to do construction. <laughs> he made me feel two inches tall. My girl was standing there. And I'm like, all these other guys got inside jobs, but they were all conference. They got to work in trophy shops. They never had to step outside in the hot air, you know, like I did. I'm digging ditches. So they put me back in there. So that was the motivation I needed. Not what Tub said for that summer job. That motivated me because when I'm out there digging ditches, and putting those big half pipes in the sewage because we were uh, we were doing construction for a racetrack. And so I used to have to be like 25 feet down and we used to have to climb up a ladder to get out of the ditch. And they dropped those big old pipes that they use skateboarders skateboard in. We're, we're lowering those pipes in and setting the, you know, the sewage lines and stuff. And that was the hardest job I've ever worked. And I, I mean, listen, I've worked almost every job and it's been humbling experiences. You know, I've, I've done everything. And that was one of the hardest jobs that I've ever done in construction because not only was it hard, it was hot. I mean, Oklahoma heat is unbearable, you know, in the summertime. And so that motivated me. So then when I came back the next year, guess what? I was player of the year, uh, all American, got invited to the Olympic tryouts, all these things that he asked me, was I, was I that at that point that my sophomore year? I was at the end of my junior year. So then when it came time for the job, he says to me, he came to me. I didn't go looking for him. He came to me and said, hey, hey, little daddy, you want that inside job? Want that inside job? Got that inside air conditioning. I said, uh, I said, coach, I really appreciate it. But I said, I want that Wayman, T Wayman Tisdale plan. And he's like, oh, I got you. And the Wayman Tisdale plan was Wayman didn't work. Nice. Yeah, and I'm not working either. I didn't work. I took a. Hey, I, I told some people laugh. People people laugh about this all the time. It's like, oh, you took a pay cut when you came to the league <laughs> from Oklahoma. I was like, hey man, that's uncalled for. That's uncalled for. We didn't get paid in Oklahoma. Well, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll never say anything. That's like we'll never, we'll never say anything. The statute about limitation, baby. Statute limitations. That's right. Well, stays. Um, I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed you being on. Thank you so much. I thank you guys uh, for having me. It was a lot of fun. Anytime I can catch up with your butt, it's always a pleasure. 
Yeah, and like I said, you know, we we really enjoyed listening to you, your telecast. We, we we hope you're going to win some games so we can really oh, yeah. enjoy them. Uh, but but you always do a great job. I'm really proud of you. Thank you very uh, much. We want you to keep to, to keep motoring and uh, and and good luck. Thank you very much.